Hello everyone, this is Kavi Arasu, Assistant Professor, Department of Mechanical Engineering. I welcome you all to this video lecture titled Nano Materials for Nano Engineering. This video lecture is framed in such a way it provides an outline about uh, nanotechnology. It describes what is a nanoscale, what are nanomaterials and their classification. This video lecture embarrasses the various fabrication techniques which are employed for fabricating the nanomaterials, especially nanoparticles and uh, nano thin films. We will discuss the potential application of these uh, nanomaterials in engineering and medical domain. Uh, in this lecture, uh, the concept of clean room environment is also concerned. With this agenda, uh, let me move on to the lecture. So before stepping into the topic, uh, I would like to quote few lines from uh, the Tamil ancient literature Tirumandiram uh, which was written 3000 years back. It says that Anuvin Anuvinai Adi Piranai Anuvin Anuvinai Ayiram Kurit Anuvin Anuvinai Anuha Vallarukka Anuvin Anuvinai Anuhalu Mame. You can see that it says that Anuvin Anuvinai Adi Piranai. It talks about uh, the God particles, the creator of an atom. So, in the second line, if you look at, we have Anuvin Anuvinai Ayiram Kurit. It talks about uh, the atomic scale manipulation, splitting up the atoms and identifying the God particles. Uh, the reason why I quoted these lines here is because uh, in some way it touches a concept of nanotechnology where in nanotechnology uh, we deal with the atomic scale manipulation so as to engineer the material for uh, many engineering applications. This literature Tirumandiram is a witness that says that the concept of nanotechnology was already there but it has taken too many years for us to develop tools that would enable us to work at this uh, dimensional scale. With this motivational line, uh, let me take you to the next slide that describes what is meant by nanotechnology. So, what is uh, nanotechnology? Nanotechnology is a study of material at atomic and molecular level, especially in the range 10 to the power minus 9 meter to 10 to the power minus 7 meter. At this uh, dimensional scale, uh, we can observe the properties of the material changes drastically from the properties of the same material. Say for example, if we take a gold material which is chemically inert at bulk scale and if you reduce the dimension of the material to a nano scale, you can observe the same gold material becomes uh, more active. So this kind of a property change happens at the nanoscale. So application of this knowledge in uh, uh, making new materials for designing new structures uh, to build novel devices in engineering and medical applications is all about uh, the nano engineering is concerned. So in this slide I have quoted another example that describes the importance of uh, atomic scale manipulation. A recent uh, research from the University of Illinois that states that the atomic scale manipulation can be used either to enhance or disturb the heat flow. If you look at the picture here, we have a quartz material, we have a gold material and uh, they are separated by a gap 1 nanometer. We have certain arrangement of the atoms here that act as an interface between the gold and the quartz. When we apply a heat pulse over the gold surface, heat flow happens across the interface and you can see depending on the type of the bonding, uh, either a weak bond or a strong bond, we can uh, either disturb the heat flow or we can enhance the heat flow. In these cases, we can make the bond either strong or weak that depends on uh, the arrangement of the atoms which is what we say atomic scale manipulation. So this kind of a research may lead to many advancement in the field of uh, heat transfer in integrated circuits, uh, combustion engines, uh, furnace, thermal insulating material science and so on. So in this slide we can understand that the nano scale uh, plays a vital role behind the concept of nanotechnology. So it is mandatory for anyone to know what is a nano scale. So this is what we are going to see in the next slide.
in the previous slide we discussed about uh, what is nanotechnology we discussed the importance of uh, nanoscale so it is time to know what is a nanoscale if you look at the table here uh, we have a complete uh, uh, defined dimensional scales so we have a base unit as one meter and you can see uh, above the base unit we have the higher order dimensional scales which is what we usually deal in conventional uh, engineering so it starts with deca hecto kilo mega giga tera and it goes on but there are scales below the base unit which is called uh, lower order dimensional scales and this nano falls in the lower order dimensional scales and you can see it starts with the deci, centi, milli, micro and nano. The concept of uh, working at the lower order dimensional scale was first motivated uh, by this uh, uh, scientist Richard Feynman uh, in the year 1959. So during his uh, talk at the American Physical Society in Pasadena, he made a clue that there is a plenty of room at the bottom that uh, one can uh, reduce the size of the things in a practical way. And uh, since then, uh, many researchers started to work at these uh, lower order dimensional scales. As I said before, uh, it has taken too many years for us to develop tools uh, that allowed us to work at this dimensional scale. You can see there are scales below the nano which is a pico, femto, auto uh, and the list goes on. In my opinion uh, in another 30-40 years people will start to talk about uh, pico technology, femto technology, uh, auto technology uh, but, but the real question is uh, whether we will have tools that would enable us to uh, work at this dimensional scale. Only the time has to answer. From the understanding of the dimensional scales, especially the nanoscale, one can imagine that what all nanomaterials could be, uh, what size uh, they could be. So let me put a clear definition to this. Um, based on the ISO 2010 and the European uh, Council recommendations, uh, we can define that uh, the nanomaterials or uh, any material which have an internal dimension or the external dimension or uh, it's a surface structure that falls in the range 1 to 100 nanometer in size. Uh, they are said to be a nanomaterial. To have a clear understanding, so imagine that we have uh, a rod. So imagine that this is a kind of a, a nano rod or you can say this is a nano wire. So we have uh, two principal dimension, uh, one is the diameter and uh, the other one is the length. So this is, uh, let me say this as a nano wire, uh, which have a diameter and length as two principal dimensions. Uh, the minimum criteria that uh, the material can be said as a nano material is, if any one of these principal uh, dimensions uh, should be nano scale. For example, if you consider the diameter, if the diameter is uh, some 20 nanometer in uh, size and uh, we don't need to worry about the length in this case because as the diameter already falls in the nano scale, uh, this will come in the, in the nano material category irrespective of the length whether it is in mm or in centimeter. So the criteria is uh, any one dimension should fall in the nano scale. In, the, in, in such case, the materials are considered as the nano materials. And uh, these nano materials are classified based on uh, the dimensional structures, based on the composition, whether they are metal based or carbon based. Uh, we have a broad classification of these materials, and that will be discussed uh, in the upcoming slides. From now, uh, we will look at the classification of uh, nanomaterials based on uh, the dimensions. Uh, to have a clear uh, uh, view, let me take you to the full slide view mode so that we can have uh, a very good discussion about uh, the different types of uh, nanomaterials. For the classification based on the dimension, we have a range of nanomaterials. First, we have a nanoparticle and clusters. Usually, they are zero dimension in structure. 
it is because at nano scale nano particles are considered to be a tiny point and they don't have any surface extender when these nano particles are grouped they are called as nano clusters next we have our nano wires rods and tubes and usually they take a one dimensional structure as you can see here they have a surface extension in one direction next we have our nano thin films which is a two dimensional structure you can see we have a surface extension in the x and y direction sometimes they are called as a nano sheets with negligible thickness so next to thin films we have a bulk nano materials usually this bulk nano materials uh, will be in combination with any one of this uh, above said nano materials and they take a three dimensional structure if you look at the figure here uh, we have uh, three different uh, combination so one is a matrix reinforced with the nano wire or nano rod the other one is a matrix reinforced with the nano particle and you can also have a combination with nano laminates uh, made as a sandwich in the bulk material so this kind of uh, bulk nano material become fancy these days as they have as they have uh, potential applications in developing vehicle structures with uh, uh, lightweight and high strength. These materials can also be classified based on the quantum confinement. The most familiar term in the nano world is the quantum confinement. If you look at the nano particle and in case if we, if we have an electron here, it cannot flow anywhere which means it is confined in all the three directions. In these cases we call this nanoparticles as three dimensionally confined nanomaterials. Next we have a nano wires and if we have electron here it can flow in one direction which means it has a degree of freedom to flow but it is confined in the other two directions and that is the reason why nano wires are called as two dimensionally confined nanomaterials and next we have a nano thin flames and obviously the electrons can flow in uh, any one of the direction which means it is confined in one direction only. In these cases nano thin films are said to be one dimensionally confined and if you consider the bulk material the electrons can flow in any direction it has a complete a degree of freedom which means it is not confined at all. In that cases it is called as zero dimensionally confined nanomaterials. So the next classification of uh, nanomaterial is based on uh, carbon materials. We have four uh, familiar allotropes of carbons uh, namely graphite, uh, diamond, fullerens and carbon nanotubes. If you look at these allotropes, uh, graphene is a basic element, only the structural arrangement that differs. If you look at the structure of the graphite, we have a layered structure and each layer uh, consists of a carbon atoms strongly bonded with one another. But they have a weak bond between these layers and uh, that is why it, it makes a material more soft. If you look at the diamond, here if you look at the structure, the carbon atoms are randomly distributed. There is no uh, layer kind of arrangement, it is a randomly distributed and that makes the material uh, more strong. So this clearly says that the structural arrangement plays a vital role in defining the properties of the material. And if you look at the fullerens, we have a C60, which is uh, 60 carbon atoms that are uh, formed to make a fullerens. Uh, usually they take a football kind of a shape and they used to carry uh, drugs in their core and the surface can be modified so as to make them more uh, biocompatible for human bodies. And next we have uh, uh, carbon nanotubes uh, which, are, uh, which are formed by rolling a graphene sheet uh, into a hollow cylinder. These uh, carbon nanotubes may have a closed end or sometimes they have a open end. Uh, we have a uh, few more slides to discuss much about the carbon nanotubes uh, in the upcoming uh, session. The next classification of uh, nanomaterials is based on uh, metals. So we have uh, 
quantum dots, nano gold and uh, titanium oxide nanoparticles are the most commonly used metal based nanomaterials. If you look at the quantum dots, they have a very different optical properties which is a size dependent. Say for example, we have a cadmium selenium quantum dot which can emit different colors of lights and that completely depends on the size of the quantum dot. Say for example, if we have a, a 2 nanometer quantum dot, it can emit a blue light and you can see the color uh, shift from blue to green as we increase the size from 2 to 3 and then it shifts from green to red as the size shifts from uh, 3 nanometer to 6 nanometer uh, in size. So this kind of uh, optical property have made this uh, material more suitable for many uh, electronic applications. Next we have a gold material which is uh, in use for many years. These gold nanomaterials are used in uh, medicines. It is made such a fine that it can get digested by the human body. So this kind of uh, uh, applications uh, make the gold material uh, a special candidate in uh, in nanomaterials. And next we have uh, the titanium oxide uh, nanoparticles. These uh, titanium oxide nanoparticles are used in paintings, coatings and uh, self-cleaning ceramics which is very trendy these days as they can uh, uh, clean the dirt which deposit over the surface. So that kind of uh, trendy applications can be found by using these titanium oxide uh, uh, nanomaterials. So with this uh, we complete the classification of nanomaterials and uh, from next slide we will discuss about uh, the various fabrication techniques uh, that are in use for fabricating the nanostructured materials. Fabrication of uh, nanomaterial is of uh, two different types. One is a top-down approach, the other one is a bottom-up approach. Uh, we have a diagram to explain these concepts. So if you look at the top-down approach, it involves in uh, slicing or cutting off a bulk material into uh, nano-sized particles. The most familiar types of uh, top-down approach is a ball milling and lithographic process. On the other hand, we have uh, bottom-up approach which involves in using atoms, molecules and even particles at nano size as, as a building blocks to develop uh, nanostructures. And uh, the most familiar types of bottom-up approach are uh, chemical vapor deposition and molecular beam epitaxy. We also see some ordering of nanosystems uh, that occurs uh, naturally by uh, uh, self-assembly and self-organization principles to form a single atomic monolayers. We have slides uh, that discuss each of these process uh, in a detailed manner. The first uh, nanofabrication method based on the top-down process uh, is a high-energy ball milling which is a most commonly used technique uh, in industries for fabricating a ceramic and metal nanopowders. Uh, this technique can also be used uh, to produce uh, polymer based nanopowders in these days. Uh, if you look at the diagram here, we have uh, two hot steel balls rotating at a high speed and uh, we have uh, chorus grained microstructures uh, feed uh, straight away to these hot steel balls where they crushed to form uh, nanopowders. If you look at the mechanism here, uh, it is very simple that the deformation uh, occurs under the shear condition and the high strain rate that leads to the formation of the nanostructures. Uh, here uh, the development of the laminar structure is a key and then uh, that leads to the grain size refinement. The only drawback by using this uh, technique is we cannot have a uniform size of uh, nanoparticles produced. Instead we will have uh, a range of uh, grain size. Um, the advantage of this uh, technique is uh, uh, this can be used uh, in uh, in mass production and that is why uh, it is in the interest of uh, industries for fabricating the uh, nanopowders. So next to this high energy ball milling, uh, we have a lithographic process which also comes in the, uh, in the top down process and this is used to create nanostructures based on the formation of a pattern on the 
uh, on the resist or a pattern on the substrate uh, through the creation of uh, resist on the substrate. If you look at the diagram here, we have uh, a mold with a certain shape and this shape will be transformed uh, to the resist which is coated over the substrate. When we hot press the mold, uh, the shape got transferred to the resist and uh, when we subject this uh, to a etching and we will remove all the unwanted portion, we will have a certain pattern uh, uh, which is developed and uh, this developed pattern will be used for various uh, lithographic process. Uh, in case if we use this developed resist pattern as an etch mask, uh, this will be subjected to uh, dry etching where uh, the uncovered portion will be etched off and this kind of a structure can be used as an interconnect for any device. In case if we use this resist as a template, uh, we can use this for metal deposition where we can see here uh, the, the metal got deposited over the surface of the resist as well as uh, the surface of the substrate and when we dissolve this, uh, this uh, in, in a solvent, uh, we can see that um, the resist uh, will get dissolved off and this will form a structure. We can use this as an interconnect for microelectromechanical systems or even uh, we can subject this again for etching uh, to make another structure. So this kind of uh, uh, technique is used in the semiconductor processing industries uh, to fabricate integrated circuits and also for producing the uh, microelectromechanical systems. In the previous slide we discussed about uh, the nanofabrication techniques based on uh, the top-down process. Now we will uh, look at the fabrication techniques which are based on uh, bottom-up. The first technique which we are going to see here is a molecular beam epitaxy. Uh, this is a crystal growth technique in which we grow epitaxial single atomic layer on a heated substrate uh, which is maintained under ultra high vacuum condition. Let me explain in detail uh, with the help of the schematic diagram. So this shows a complete experimental setup for making a thin flame. And uh, you can see we have a substrate holder and heater uh, which is used to hold the substrate and maintain the substrate at certain temperature. Next we have a ion sputtering gun which is used to clean the surface of the substrate uh, before we start the deposition. So the ions from this gun will sputter the surface of the substrate and make the surface uh, ready clean for deposition. So next we have uh, the effusion cells which is also called as a nuts and cells in which we have all the chemical compounds like uh, indium, gallium, arsenide, uh, lead and so on. And uh, you can see these components may be either in form of a solid or gas. So we have a separate uh, heater unit uh, which is controlled by the processor and uh, it is used to heat, uh, heat the chemical source to 500 to 600 degrees Celsius um, by which these uh, solid components will evaporate uh, and uh, they will deposit over the substrate surface. And uh, these efficient cells can be opened and closed with, with the help of a shutter control. Um, for example, when we have this indium efficient cell uh, opened, the other uh, efficient cells will be closed so that we will have the first layer growth made up of indium and once we are done with the indium we will close this indium efficient cell and we will open the gallium so that the gallium layer will grow on the um, on the indium layer so this is how we can create a layer after layer uh, for a multi-layer thin flame uh, fabrications and you can see we have electron gun uh, from where the electrons are hit the sample and they are collected in the uh, reflection high energy electron diffractometer. So we can uh, get all the details about the samples, especially the, uh, the type of the thin flame uh, thickness and we can also study the crystal structure of these thin flames. Uh, we have a mass spectrometer here to measure the mass to volume ratio of these chemical components which are deposited on the substrate surface. Uh, here we have uh, uh, agar analysis uh, uh, spectrometer which is used to measure uh, in-depth uh, structural arrangement of this substrate. Uh, 
uh, we have a liquid nitrogen coolant which is used to cool the system so that uh, it can uh, it can maintain the operating temperature and uh, uh, this complete process happens at ultra high vacuum as I said before. So we, we will have a pump to maintain the pressure uh, which is around 5 into 10 to the power minus 14 atmospheric pressure. Usually the chamber size will be in uh, 1.5 meter in diameter and you can see uh, we can develop a gallium or semiconductor thin films uh, with this kind of a molecular beam epitaxy. We often use this uh, molecular beam epitaxy to grow thin flames, uh, thin flame structures uh, typically in the range from few nanometers to one uh, micrometer in thickness. Uh, many industries use uh, this uh, molecular beam epitaxy to develop both uh, single layer thin flames and multi layer thin flames. Uh, the next topic which we are going to see now is uh, the spin coating technique which is also uh, used for uh, making uh, nano thin flames. Spin coating uh, uh, technique is a procedure used for making a, a uniform deposition of thin flames on a flat substrate. If you look at the diagram here, uh, we have uh, a rotating disc on which we will fix a flat substrate. We will pour the precursor solution at the center and, we, and set the disc to rotate at certain speed. So due to the centrifugal force, the precursor solution will spread over to form a uniform layer on the flat substrate and we will subject this for uh, heat treatment and finally we will have uh, the thin flames formed. Uh, you can see here we have a, a clear step-by-step -step procedure uh, that describes the process. First we will pour the spin solution on the uh, flat substrate and set it to rotate at 3000 uh, 3, RPM uh, for 30 seconds. Then we will uh, dry the hot plate for uh, 250 degrees Celsius and uh, that takes place for 5 minutes. Then we will do the heat treatment process uh, to improve the mechanical and physical properties of the thin flames formed. Uh, and that takes place for 15 minutes around 400 degrees Celsius. And uh, finally we will have uh, a single thin flame formed on the substrate. If we repeat the procedure, uh, uh, once again we can grow another layer and this is how we make uh, multi-layer thin frames. So here we have some uh, recommended uh, specifications uh, to obtain a very good uh, thin flames. Uh, for low speed we will have a high thickness and when we subject that for heat treatment uh, we observe cracks formed on the surface. If you go with a high speed uh, the flame thickness will be very negligible uh, that doesn't make it suitable for applications. So if we go with the medium speed around 3000 rpm we have thin flames uh, which have shown a very good uh, mechanical properties um, at this specification. So with this uh, we, uh, we complete the fabrication techniques uh, which are used for making uh, nano thin. The last fabrication uh, technique which we are going to discuss uh, is the ordering of nano systems through self assembly and self organization. Self assembly describes uh, the direct bonding of molecules from solution to surface, uh, whereas the self organization refers to the assembly of nanoparticles in a tunable uh, pattern. If you look at the diagram here, uh, we have a silicon substrate uh, which is coated with the gold. When we introduce this uh, gold coated silicon substrate into the thiol solution, you can see here this uh, thiol uh, solution, I mean the molecules from the thiol solution get absorbed on the gold surface and after that uh, they can uh, uh, self-organize uh, and uh, assemble themselves in a regular uh, pattern to form a single atomic uh, monolayers. So this is very clear here you can see uh, we have a gold uh, coated surface of a, a silicon substrate and you can see here uh, due to absorption the head of uh, the molecules get uh, uh, bonded with the gold material uh, and you can see the length of uh, the chain molecules uh, that self assemble themselves uh, in a tunable pattern. So this is uh, very clearly shown here uh, step by step and uh, the important thing that we have to discuss here is uh, the length of the chain molecules. If we have a shorter length we will have more defects 
uh, we will not have a regular uh, arranged structure uh, on the on the gold surface so that if we have a long chain we can have uh, a more uh, uh, regular and tunable pattern uh, which is formed on the gold surface so with this uh, we complete uh, the fabrication techniques and in the next slide we will discuss about uh, the nanomaterial uh, which is of uh, of our interest. The nanomaterial uh, which is in our interest is a carbon nanotubes. When one or uh, more graphene layers are rolled up to form a cylinder uh, either with a open end or closed end, they are uh, said to be carbon nanotubes. Uh, these carbon nanotubes can be classified based on the number of walls they have. If they have a single wall, it is called as a single wall carbon nanotubes and they can be up to uh, 2 nanometer in diameter and if they have uh, a multi-wall they are called as a multi-wall carbon nanotubes and uh, they can be up to uh, 20 nanometer in diameter apart from this we can also classify the carbon nanotubes based on the structure we have three major classification uh, one is a zigzag armchair and chiral if you look at the diagram here we have uh, the carbon nanotubes and uh, this is the axis of the carbon nanotube. When this carbon uh, carbon bond is uh, parallel to the axis, uh, we can see a zigzag uh, manner on the circumference of the carbon nanotube. In this case, it is called zigzag uh, carbon nanotube. Uh, next to the zigzag, we have an armchair. In this case, if you look at here, this carbon-carbon uh, bond is uh, perpendicular to the axis of the carbon nanotubes. In this case, you can see we have a armchair uh, kind of a shape on the circumference of the carbon nanotube. And uh, this is why it is called uh, armchair carbon nanotubes. And next, we have a chiral in which we can see there is a twist on the surface of the carbon nanotubes. So this is called a chiral types or a chiral nanotubes. Uh, usually uh, it is defined by the chirality which is a measure of twist. When you look at the properties of the carbon nanotubes, uh, it is very impressive. Uh, we have uh, the elastic modulus in the range of uh, 1 terapascal and the tensile strength uh, in the range of 100 gigapascal. Uh, this is nearly a tenfold times greater than any industrial fiber. And if you look at the thermal uh, conductivity of the carbon nanotubes, uh, it ranges in uh, 3500 watts per meter Kelvin. This makes it more suitable for many uh, heat transfer applications, especially in a, in a phase change material where they uh, incorporate these carbon nanotubes uh, to enhance the thermal properties of the base material. Carbon nanotubes also possess uh, some uh, electrical properties as you can see, they can carry uh, 10 power 9 ampere per centimeter square. So this is why the carbon nanotubes uh, become a dominant candidate in many uh, engineering applications. Carbon nanotubes have a wide range of uh, engineering applications. Uh, in this slide, we will look at some of the recent applications where the carbon nanotubes are used. So carbon nanotubes are used in cyclic frames to make uh, the bike frame more strong and light in weight and uh, carbon nanotubes are also used in a bulletproof vest as you can see these carbon nanotubes have a very good mechanical properties uh, as they are very high in strength uh, it, it, it doesn't allow the bullet to penetrate through and this is why it becomes uh, a more suitable for uh, for making this uh, nano armor uh, this kind of uh, defense applications uh, are in a uh, trend and you can see these carbon nanotubes also used as anti-fouling coating uh, in ship hulls so the hull of the ships uh, subjects to the surface fouling and that is a major issue uh, in uh, many of the industries uh, shipbuilding industries and the carbon nanotubes uh, in paint can be used as anti-fouling agents uh, to prevent the surface fouling Carbon nanotubes are also used as uh, uh, drug carrying vehicles uh, in, in medical field to carry the cancer drugs and uh, they deliver the drugs straight away to the cancer cells. So this will uh, reduce the side effects uh, for the patients. So these are uh, some of the trendy applications 
uh, of, carbon, of carbon nanotubes. Now we will look at the timeline applications and advancement in the field of nanoengineering. This slide will consolidate the past, present and future application of uh, nanomaterial. If you look at the past application, we use them for wear resistant coating for cutting tools to improve their lifetime. They are used as a pigments in paints uh, which make the paints functionally more suitable for any climatic conditions. They have found applications in pharmaceuticals and drugs, especially in making uh, skin pigments which are used uh, to protect the human skin from ultraviolet radiations. They have also found applications uh, as a thin films in electronic devices. If you look at the present application, uh, nanomaterials can be used as an additive in fuels for improving the engine performance and uh, control the uh, emissions. We can also functionally design the fluid to extract more heat, uh, which have found uh, more suitable for mini channel heat sinks uh, in, um, in microfluidic systems. They can be used to carry the drugs and uh, used for healing the wound. In these days, we have uh, nano gels uh, which are uh, used to heal the wound in, a, in an effective way. And uh, biosensors and detectors are used uh, to monitor the human body uh, to detect any diseases that occurs uh, in the human body. And if you look at the future application, uh, we have uh, many interesting things to come. The first one is a nano composite for vehicle structure. This may lead to many advancement in the field of vehicle structural uh, design and development. And nanopolar structures for nuclear ion trapping may completely change our opinion about the nuclear power plants and their emissions. We can also use uh, nano biomaterials for making artificial organs which could uh, replace the failed organs in the human body and high-end flexible displays in the electronic gadgets, future applications of uh, nanomaterials. Uh, this will say that uh, the nanomaterials will definitely pay a, play a dominant role uh, in the near future. The last topic of this uh, video lecture uh, is the clean room environment uh, which has to be maintained for any nano laboratory. It is mandatory for anyone uh, to undergo the risk assessment procedure before uh, involving ourselves in nanofabrication. Uh, as you can see here, the clean room uh, air handling itself a tedious job as we have to maintain uh, a positive pressure of a 5 Pascal and uh, the room temperature should be maintained with uh, 20 degrees Celsius uh, with 45 percentage humidity. And you can see here we have to employ a, uh, high efficiency particulate filters and ultra fine particulate filters to filter away the dust particles. Uh, this is need to be done because uh, the dust particles may tend to deposit over the nanostructure surface and that may lead to the surface contamination. You can also see here uh, one should wear proper uh, lab coats, gloves and goggles to avoid uh, exposure to the nanoparticles. Uh, it is with concern uh, about the human safety. So this uh, states the importance of clean room environment that has to be taken uh, in consideration for designing a nano laboratory. I have given all the references uh, which I have used uh, for making this video lecture. Uh, you can refer these articles for more detailed information about the nano structured materials and the concerned engineering applications. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed this video lecture. Uh, thanks for watching. Take care. Bye.